Al Ghazali, full name Abu Hamid Muhammad ibn Muhammad al Ghazali Abhamd Mehmd bin Mehmd al Ghazali, Latinized al Ghazalis or al Ghazal, c. 1058 19 December 1111, was one of the most prominent and influential philosophers, theologians, jurists, and mystics of Sunni Islam. He was of Persian origin. Islamic tradition considers him to be a mujadid, a renewer of the faith who, according to the prophetic hadith, appears once every century to restore the faith of the Ummah, the Islamic community. His works were so highly acclaimed by his contemporaries that Al Ghazali was awarded the honorific title, Proof of Islam. Hujat al-Islam, al-Ghazali believed that the Islamic spiritual tradition had become moribund and that the spiritual sciences taught by the first generation of Muslims had been forgotten. That resulted in his writing his magnum opus entitled Iyya Ulam al-Din, The Revival of the Religious Sciences. Among his other works, the Tafit al falasifa Incoherence of the Philosophers, is a significant landmark in the history of philosophy, as it advances the critique of Aristotelian science developed later in 14th century Europe. Life The believed date of al-Ghazali's birth, as given by Ibn al-Jazi, is off 450 Modern estimates place it at off 448 on the basis of certain statements in al-Ghazali's correspondence and autobiography. He was a Muslim scholar, law specialist, rationalist, and spiritualist of Persian descent. He was born in Tabaran, a town in the district of Tus, Khorasan now part of Iran. A posthumous tradition, the authenticity of which has been questioned in recent scholarship, is that his father, a man of Persian descent, died in poverty and left the young al-Ghazali and his brother Ahmad to the care of a Sufi. Al-Ghazali's contemporary and first biographer, Abd al-Ghafir al-Furisi, records merely that al-Ghazali began to receive instruction in fiqh Islamic jurisprudence from Ahmad al-Radakani, a local teacher. He later studied under al-Juwaini, the distinguished jurist and theologian and the most outstanding Muslim scholar of his time. In Nishapur, perhaps after a period of study in Gurgan. After Al Juwaini's death in 1085, Al Ghazali departed from Nishapur and joined the court of Nizam al Mulk, the powerful vizier of the Seljuk sultans, which was likely centered in Isfahan. After bestowing upon him the titles of brilliance of the religion and eminence among the religious leaders." Nizam al-Mulk advanced al-Ghazali in July 1091 to the "...most prestigious and most challenging." Professorial at the time, in the Nizamiya Madrasa in Baghdad, he underwent a spiritual crisis in 1095, abandoned his career and left Baghdad on the pretext of going on pilgrimage to Mecca. Making arrangements for his family, he disposed of his wealth and adopted an ascetic lifestyle. According to biographer Duncan B. MacDonald, the purpose of abstaining from scholastic work was to confront the spiritual experience and more ordinary understanding of the Word and the traditions. After some time in Damascus and Jerusalem, with a visit to Medina and Mecca in 1096, he returned to Tus to spend the next several years in Uzla seclusion. 
The seclusion consisted in abstaining from teaching at state-sponsored institutions, but he continued to publish, receive visitors and teach in the Zawiya private madrasa and Kanka Sufi monastery that he had built. Fakur al-Mulk, Grand Vizier to Ahmad Sanjar, pressed al-Ghazali to return to the Nizamiya in Nishapur. Al-Ghazali reluctantly capitulated in 1106, fearing rightly that he and his teachings would meet with resistance and controversy. He later returned to Tus and declined an invitation in 1110 from the Grand Vizier of the Seljuk Sultan Muhammad I to return to Baghdad. He died on 19 December 1111. According to Abd al Ghafir al Farisi, he had several daughters but no sons. <laughs> <laughs> School affiliations Al Ghazali contributed significantly to the development of a systematic view of Sufism and its integration and acceptance in mainstream Islam. As a scholar of Orthodox Islam, he belonged to the Shafi'i school of Islamic jurisprudence and to the Asharite school of theology. Al Ghazali received many titles such as Sheriff al Aima, Shrefalaped Zain ud Din, Zin al Din, and Hujat al Islam. He is viewed as the key member of the influential Asharite school of early Muslim philosophy and the most important refuter of the Mutazilites. However, he chose a slightly different position in comparison with the Asharites. His beliefs and thoughts differ in some aspects from the orthodox Asharite school. Topic: <laughs> Works. A total of about 60 works can be attributed to Al-Ghazali. Topic: Incoherence of the philosophers His 11th century book titled The Incoherence of the Philosophers marks a major turn in Islamic epistemology. The encounter with skepticism led al Ghazali to embrace a form of theological occasionalism, or the belief that all causal events and interactions are not the product of material conjunctions but rather the immediate and present will of God. In the next century, Averroes drafted a lengthy rebuttal of al Ghazali's incoherence entitled The Incoherence of the Incoherence. However, the epistemological course of Islamic thought had already been set. Al Ghazali gave as an example of the illusion of independent laws of cause the fact that cotton burns when coming into contact with fire. While it might seem as though a natural law was at work, it happened each and every time only because God willed it to happen. The event was a direct product of divine intervention as any more attention-grabbing miracle. Averroes, by contrast, insisted while God created the natural law, humans could more usefully say that fire caused cotton to burn because creation had a pattern that they could discern the incoherence also marked a turning point in islamic philosophy in its vehement rejections of aristotle and plato the book took aim at the Falasifa, a loosely defined group of Islamic philosophers from the 8th through the 11th centuries most notable among them Avicenna and Al-Farabi who drew intellectually upon the ancient Greeks. This long-held argument has been criticized. 
George Saliba in 2007 argued that the decline of science in the 11th century has been overstated, pointing to continuing advances, particularly in astronomy, as late as the 14th century. On the other hand, Hassan Hassan in 2012 argued that while indeed scientific thought in Islam was stifled in the 11th century, the person mostly to blame is not al-Ghazali but Nizam al-Mulk. <inaudible> Autobiography The autobiography Al Ghazali wrote towards the end of his life, Deliverance from Error, Al Adlal Al Munshi Min Al Dalal, is considered a work of major importance. In it, Al Ghazali recounts how, once a crisis of epistemological skepticism was resolved by a light which God Most High cast into my breast the key to most knowledge." He studied and mastered the arguments of Kalam, Islamic philosophy, and Ismailism. Though appreciating what was valid in the first two of these, at least, he determined that all three approaches were inadequate and found ultimate value only in the mystical experience and insight the state of prophecy or nubuwa he attained as a result of following Sufi practices. William James, in Varieties of Religious Experience, considered the autobiography an important document for the purely literary student who would like to become acquainted with the inwardness of religions other than the Christian. Because of the scarcity of recorded personal religious confessions and autobiographical literature from this period outside the Christian tradition, Topic: The revival of religious sciences. Another of Al Ghazali's major works is Iya Ulam Al Din or Iya Ulumidin, the revival of religious sciences. It covers almost all fields of Islamic sciences, fiqh Islamic jurisprudence, kalam theology, and Sufism. It contains four major sections: acts of worship, rub al abadat, norms of daily life, rub al adatat, the ways to perdition, rub al mulakat, and the ways to salvation, rub al munjiyat. The Iyya became the most frequently recited Islamic text after the Quran and the Hadith. Its great achievement was to bring orthodox Sunni theology and Sufi mysticism together in a useful, comprehensive guide to every aspect of Muslim life and death. The book was well received by Islamic scholars such as Nawawi who stated that were the books of Islam all to be lost, excepting only the Iyya, it would suffice to replace them all." Ghazali rewrote the revival of religious sciences in Persian to reach a larger audience. He published this book under the name The Alchemy of Happiness. The Alchemy of Happiness The Alchemy of Happiness is a rewritten version of the revival of the religious sciences. After the existential crisis that caused him to completely re-examine his way of living and his approach to religion, Al-Ghazali put together the Alchemy of Happiness to reassert his fundamental belief that a connection to God was an integral part of the joy of living. The book is broken into four different sections. The first of these is Knowledge of Self, where Al-Ghazali asserts that while food, sex, and other indulgences might slake humans' appetites temporarily, they in turn make a human into an animal, and therefore will never give true happiness and fulfillment. In order to find oneself, people must devote themselves to God by showing restraint and discipline rather than gluttony of the senses. 
The second installment is called Knowledge of God, where Al-Ghazali states that the events that occur during one's life are meant to point an individual towards God, and that God will always be strong, no matter how far humans deviate from his will. The third section of the alchemy of happiness is Knowledge of the World. Here he states that the world is merely a place where humans learn to love God, and prepare for the future, or the afterlife, the nature of which will be determined by our actions in this phase of our journey to happiness. The final section is knowledge of the future world, which details how there are two types of spirits within a man, the angelic spirit and the animal spirit. Al-Ghazali details the types of spiritual tortures unbelievers experience, as well as the path that must be taken in order to attain spiritual enlightenment. This book serves as a culmination of the transformation Ghazali goes through during his spiritual awakening. Disciplining the Soul one of the key sections of Ghazali's revival of the religious sciences is disciplining the soul, which focuses on the internal struggles that every Muslim will face over the course of his lifetime. The first chapter primarily focuses on how one can develop himself into a person with positive attributes and good personal characteristics. The second chapter has a more specific focus, sexual satisfaction and gluttony. Here, Ghazali states that indeed every man has these desires and needs, and that it is natural to want these things. However, the Prophet explicitly states that there must be a middle ground for man, in order to practice the tenets of Islam faithfully. The ultimate goal that Ghazali is presenting not only in these two chapters, but in the entirety of the revival of the religious sciences, is that there must be moderation in every aspect of the soul of a man, an equilibrium. These two chapters were the 22nd and 23rd chapters, respectively, in Ghazali's revival of the religious sciences. It's also important to note here that Ghazali draws from Greek as well as Islamic philosophy in crafting this literary staple, even though much of the incoherence of the philosophers, his most well-known work, takes a critical aim at their perspective. The Eternity of the World Al-Ghazali crafted his rebuttal of the Aristotelian viewpoint on the creation of the world in the eternity of the world. Al-Ghazali essentially formulates two main arguments for what he views as a sacrilegious thought process. Central to the Aristotelian approach is the concept that motion will always precede motion, or in other words, a force will always create another force, and therefore for a force to be created, another force must act upon that force. This means that in essence time stretches infinitely both into the future and into the past, which therefore proves that God did not create the universe at one specific point in time. Ghazali counters this by first stating that if the world was created with exact boundaries, then in its current form there would be no need for a time before the creation of the world by God. The second argument Ghazali makes is that because humans can only imagine the time before the creation of the world, and your imagination is a fictional thing, that all the time before the world was created is fictional as well, and therefore does not matter as it was not intended by God to be understood by humans. Although these proofs would go on to be disproved by individuals such as Sir Isaac Newton laws of motion, the eternity of the world would have a major impact on the beliefs of Muslim scholars and philosophers up to the present day. The decisive criterion for distinguishing Islam from clandestine unbelief 
Al-Ghazali lays out in the decisive criterion for distinguishing Islam from clandestine unbelief his approach to Muslim orthodoxy. Ghazali veers from the often hard-line stance of many of his contemporaries during this time period and states that as long as one believes in the Prophet Muhammad and God himself, there are many different ways to practice Islam and that any of the many traditions practiced in good faith by believers should not be viewed as heretical by other Muslims. While Ghazali does state that any Muslim practicing Islam in good faith is not guilty of apostasy, he does outline in the criterion that there is one standard of Islam that is more correct than the others, and that those practicing the faith incorrectly should be moved to change. In Ghazali's view, only the Prophet himself could deem a faithfully practicing Muslim an infidel, and his work was a pushback against the religious persecution and strife that occurred often during this time period between various Islamic sects. <laughs> <laughs> Works in Persian Al-Ghazali wrote most of his works in Arabic and few in Persian. His most important Persian work is Kimyaye Saadat The Alchemy of Happiness. It is Al-Ghazali's own Persian version of Ihyul Alumuddin, the revival of religious sciences in Arabic, but a shorter work. It is one of the outstanding works of 11th century Persian literature. The book was published several times in Tehran by the addition of Hussein Kadev Jam, a renowned Iranian scholar. It is translated to English, Arabic, Turkish, Urdu, Azerbaijani, and other languages. Apart from Kimya, the most celebrated of Al Ghazali's works in Persian is Nasiat al Muluk, The Counseling Kings, written most probably for Sultan Ahmad Sanjar ibn Maleksha. In the edition published by Jalaluddin Humayi, the book consists of two parts of which only the first can reliably be attributed to Al-Ghazali. The language and the contents of some passages are similar to the Kimyaye Saadat. The second part differs considerably in content and style from the well-known writings of Al-Ghazali. It contains the stories of pre-Islamic kings of Persia, especially those of Anashirvan. Nasiat al muluk was early translated to Arabic under the title Al-Tibr al-Masbuk fi Nasihat al muluk The Forged Sword in Counseling Kings. Zat e provision for the hereafter, is an important Persian book of Al Ghazali, but gained less scholarly attention. The greater part of it consists of the Persian translation of one of his Arabic books, Bediyat al Hadaya, beginning of guidance. It contains, in addition, the same contents as the Kimyaye Saadat. The book was most probably written during the last years of his life. Its manuscripts are in Kabul, Library of the Department of Press, and in Leiden. Pand Nama, Book of Counsel, is another book of advice and probably attributed to Sultan Sanjar. The introduction to the book relates that Al-Ghazali wrote the book in response to a certain king who had asked him for advice. I Farzand o son, is a short book of counsel that Al-Ghazali wrote for one of his students. The book was early translated to Arabic entitled Ayahal Wilad. Another Persian work is Hamakati Ali Ibahat or Radi Ebahaya, condemnation of antinomians, which is his fatwa in Persian illustrated with Quranic verses and hadiths. 
Fazilul al Anam min Rasili Hujat al Islam is the collection of letters in Persian that al Ghazali wrote in response to the kings, ministers, jurists, and some of his friends after he returned to Khorasan. The collection was gathered by one of his grandchildren after his death, under five sections, chapters. The longest letter is the response to objections raised against some of his statements in Mishkat al-Anwar and al-Munchi min al-Dalal The first letter is the one which al-Ghazali wrote to Sultan Sanjar presenting his excuse for teaching in Nizamiya of Nishapur, followed by al-Ghazali's speech in the court of Sultan Sanjar. Al-Ghazali makes an impressive speech when he was taken to the king's court in Nishapur in 1106, giving very influential counsels, asking the sultan once again for excusing him from teaching in Nizamiya. The sultan was so impressed that he ordered Al-Ghazali to write down his speech so that it will be sent to all the ulemas of Khorasan and Iraq. Topic. Influence During his life, he authored over 70 books on science, Islamic reasoning and Sufism. Al-Ghazali distributed his book The Incoherence of Philosophers, set apart as the defining moment in Islamic epistemology. The experience that he had with suspicion drove Al-Ghazali to shape a conviction that all occasions and connections are not the result of material conjunctions but are the present and prompt will of God. Another of Al-Ghazali's most prestigious works is Iyya Ulam al-Din, The Revival of Religious Sciences. The work covers all fields of Islamic science and incorporates Islamic statute, philosophy and Sufism. It had numerous positive reactions, and Al-Ghazali at that point composed a condensed form in Persian under the title kimiya ye saadat the alchemy of happiness. Although Al-Ghazali said that he has composed more than 70 books, attributed to him are more than 400 books. Al-Ghazali likewise assumed a noteworthy part in spreading Sufism and Sharia. He was the first to consolidate the ideas of Sufism into Sharia laws and the first to give a formal depiction of Sufism in his works. His works fortify the position of Sunni Islam, contrasted with different schools of thought. Al-Ghazali had an important influence on both later Muslim philosophers and Christian medieval philosophers. Margaret Smith writes in her book Al-Ghazali, The Mystic London 1944, there can be no doubt that Al-Ghazali's works would be among the first to attract the attention of these European scholars." Page 220. Then she emphasizes, "...the greatest of these Christian writers who was influenced by Al-Ghazali was Saint Thomas Aquinas who made a study of the Arabic writers and admitted his indebtedness to them, having studied at the University of Naples where the influence of Arab literature and culture was predominant at the time." In addition, Aquinas' interest in Islamic studies could be attributed to the infiltration of Latin Averroism in the 13th century, especially at the University of Paris. The period following Ghazali has tentatively been called the Golden Age of Arabic philosophy. Initiated by Ghazali's successful integration of logic into the Islamic seminary madrasa curriculum, Al-Ghazali also played a major role in integrating Sufism with Sharia. 
He was also the first to present a formal description of Sufism in his works. His works also strengthened the status of Sunni Islam against other schools. The Batanite Ismailism had emerged in Persian territories and were gaining more and more power during al-Ghazali's period, as Nizam al-Mulk was assassinated by the members of Ismailis. Al-Ghazali strongly rejected their ideology and wrote several books on criticism of Batinias which significantly weakened their status. Al-Ghazali succeeded in gaining widespread acceptance for Sufism at the expense of philosophy. At the same time, in his refutation of philosophers he made use of their philosophical categories and thus helped to give them wider circulation. His influences and impact on Sufism and Islam during the 11th century has been a subject of debate in contemporary times. Some fifty works that he had written as evidenced that he was one of the most important Islamic thinkers of his time. Three of his works, Ihaya Ulam ad Din, Revival of Religious Sciences, Tafit al Falasifa, The Incoherence of Philosophers, and Al Muniki Min Alal, Al Ghazali's Path to Sufism, His Deliverance from Error, are still widely read and circulated among Islamic scholars today. After the death of al-Ghazali, it is believed there followed a long era in which there was a notable absence of Islamic philosophers, contributing to the status of Ghazali in the modern era. The staple of his religious philosophy was arguing that the Creator was the center point of all human life that played a direct role in all world affairs. Al Ghazali's influence was not limited to Islam, but in fact his works were widely circulated among Christian and Hebrew scholars and philosophers. Some of the more notable philosophers and scholars in the West include David Hume, Dante, and St. Thomas Aquinas. Moses ben Maimon, a Jewish theologian was deeply interested and vested in the works of al-Ghazali. One of the more notable achievements of Ghazali were his writing and reform of education that laid the path of Islamic education from the 12th to the 19th centuries CE. All Ghazali's works were heavily relied upon by Islamic mathematicians and astronomers such as at Tusi. Early childhood development was a central focal point of Al Ghazali. He worked to influence and develop a program to mold the young minds of children at an early age to develop their mind and character. He stressed that socialization, family, and schools were central in the achievement of language, morality, and behavior. He emphasized incorporating physical fitness such as games that were important in the development of young minds to attract the idea of attending schools and maintaining an education. In addition, he stressed the importance of understanding and sharing cultures in the classrooms to achieve a civic harmony that would be expressed outside the classroom and kindness to one another. In his writings he placed this responsibility upon the teachers. His treatise on early education centered on Islamic laws, God, and memorizing the Quran to achieve literary skill. Ghazali emphasized the importance that there should be a dual respect in regard to the teacher and the pupil. Whereas the teacher guides the student and takes the role of a father figure and offers counsel to the student, and the student respects the teacher as a patriarch. He stressed that the teacher needed to pay attention to the learning paces of his students so that he could help them be successful in academic achievements. Al Ghazali was, by every indication of his writings, a true mystic in the Persian sense. 
He believed himself to be more mystical or religious than he was philosophical however, he is more widely regarded by some scholars as a leading figure of Islamic philosophy and thought. He describes his philosophical approach as a seeker of true knowledge, a deeper understanding of the philosophical and scientific, and a better understanding of mysticism and cognition. In the contemporary world, Al-Ghazali is renowned not only for his contribution to Sufism, Islam, philosophy, or education. But his work and ethical approach transcends another boundary into the Islamic business practice. In the Journal of Business Ethics, authors Yusuf Sadani and Akram al Aris's explain how Islamic business ethics are governed by the writings of Abu Hamid al Ghazali and even posit that al Ghazali is the greatest Muslim since the Prophet Muhammad. Traditional Islamists are influenced by Ghazali's writings since he was indebted to writing about and incorporating Sharia law. They emphasize, "...his mastery of philosophical logic and reasoning earned him the title of philosopher without losing his status as a religious scholar." All Ghazali's reasoning on the use of intellect in combination with the rational and spiritual is an integral part of Muslim society today. Therefore, they approach the business perspective with the same ideology and organizational thought. <laughs> Works. Al Ghazali mentioned the number of his works, more than 70, in one of his letters to Sultan Sanjar in the late years of his life. Some five dozen are plausibly identifiable, and several hundred attributed works, many of them duplicates because of varying titles, are doubtful or spurious. The tradition of falsely attributing works to Al-Ghazali increased in the 13th century, after the dissemination of the large corpus of works by Ibn Arabi. Bibliographies have been published by William Montgomery Watt, the works attributed to Al-Ghazali, Maurice Bouygues, Essay de Chronologie des Herbes d'Al-Ghazali, and others. Topic. Reception of work According to William Montgomery Watt, Al-Ghazali considered himself to be the mujadid revivier, of his age. Many, perhaps most, later Muslims concurred and, according to Watt, some have even considered him to be the greatest Muslim after Muhammad. As an example, the Islamic scholar al Safadi stated, and the jurist, al Yafi'i stated, the Shafi'i jurist al Subki stated, also a widely considered Sunni scholar, Al-Dahabi in, his praise of Al-Ghazali, wrote, Al-Ghazali, the Imam and Sheikh, the prominent scholar, Hujat al-Islam, the wonder of his time, Zayn al-Din Abu Hamid Muhammad ibn Muhammad ibn Muhammad ibn Ahmad al-Tusi al-Shafi'i al-Ghazali, the author of many books and one possessed of utter intelligence. He studied fiqh in his own town, then he moved to Nisipur in the company of a group of students. He stayed with the Imam al haramain and gained a deep knowledge of fiqh within a short period. He became well versed in ilm al kalam and debate, until he became the best of debater. Ibn Rushd, a rationalist, famously responded that. To say that philosophers are incoherent is itself to make an incoherent statement. 
Rushid's book, The Incoherence of the Incoherence, attempted to refute al Ghazali's views, but the work was not well received in the Muslim community, according to Firaz al Khatib. When one reads Imam al Ghazali's works at a very superficial level, one can easily misunderstand what he is saying as anti scientific in general. The truth, however, is that Al-Ghazali's only warning to students is to not fully accept all the beliefs and ideas of a scholar simply because of his achievements in mathematics and science. By issuing such a warning, Al-Ghazali is in fact protecting the scientific enterprise for future generations by insulating it from being mixed with theoretical philosophy that could eventually dilute science itself to a field based on conjecture and reasoning alone. Al Ghazali was commonly accused by Orientalist scholars of causing a decline in scientific advancement in Islam because of his refutation of the new philosophies of his time. He believed he saw danger in the statements made by philosophers that suggested that God was not all knowing or even non existent, which strongly contradicted his orthodox Islamic belief. He is known today for his role in protecting the traditional Islamic beliefs of the Muslim culture. His contributions played a role in the revival of the Islamic faith as taught by the Prophet Muhammad before him, despite the challenges presented by philosophy during his time. Topic: <laughs> Economic philosophy. Most aspects of Al-Ghazali's life were heavily influenced by his Islamic beliefs, and his economic philosophy was no exception. He held economic activity to a very high level of importance in his life and thought that others should as well, as he felt that it was not only necessary for the overall benefit to society but also to achieve spiritual wholeness and salvation. In his view, the worldly life of humanity depended on the economic activity of people and so he considered being economically active to be a mandated part of the Sharia law. He established three goals of economic activity that he believed were part of one's religious obligation as well as beneficial to the individual. Achievement of self-sufficiency for one's survival, provision for the well-being of one's progeny, and provision for assisting those in economic need. He argued that subsistence living, or living in a way that provides the basic necessities for only one's family, would not be an acceptable practice to be held by the general population because of the detrimental results that he believed that would bring upon the economy, but he acknowledged that some people may choose to live the subsistence lifestyle at their own will for the sake of their personal religious journey. Conversely, he discouraged people from purchasing or possessing excessive material items, suggesting that any additional money earned could be given to provide for the poor. Al Ghazali thought that it should not be necessary to force equality of income in society but that people should be driven by the spirit of Islamic Brotherhood to share their wealth willingly, but he recognized that it is not always the case. He believed that wealth earned could be used in two potential manners. One is for good, such as maintaining the health of oneself and their family as well as taking care of others and any other actions seen as positive for the Islamic community. 
the other is what Al-Ghazali would consider misuse, spending it selfishly on extravagant or unnecessary material items. In terms of trade, Al-Ghazali discussed the necessity of exchanging goods across close cities as well as larger borders because it allows more goods, which may be necessary and not yet available, to be accessible to more people in various locations. He recognized the necessity of trade and its overall beneficial effect on the economy, but making money in that way might not be considered the most virtuous in his beliefs. He did not support people taking excessive profits from their trade sales. Topic: See also Mujadid Nasahat name equals equals notes